Hey everyone and welcome to yet another episode of the Kitabi Karwan podcast. Firstly, I would like to apologize to everyone for the inordinate delay on our part. There were some issues with our technical equipment which was causing all of this, but now everything's fixed and we are back with this episode. For this episode, we have with us Mr. John Zubreski, author of House of Jaipur, which is an absolutely riveting book about one of the most famous royal families of India and delves into so much detail through personal interviews detailed scavenging of archives and talking to people in the know how and i don't want to ruin this for you but let's dive into the interview with mr zubreski hello everyone today we have with us john zubreski uh, the author of house of jaipur a fantastic book tracing the history of the jaipur royal family mostly through the late uh, 19th uh, century and the 20th century and I'm sure most of you who are tuning in have read the book already or have heard about it. So, without any further ado, we'll start. Welcome, John. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Sadat. It's a pleasure to be here um, with you virtually <laughs> in this space. But it's uh, I wish I could be in India to have this conversation. But alas, it's uh, not not going to be the well, case. <laughs> well, that's 2020 for you. But John, before we begin this conversation, there's something I want to ask you. Um, so we know a lot about you from the brief author profile that comes up behind the book and something that we can google on the internet but can you tell our listeners something about you which they will not find on the internet <laughs> <laughs> oh um no oh, that's pretty hard these days uh <laughs> i wouldn't want them to know about me but uh, uh look i mean i've i've be, i've been going to india for, for more than 40 years uh uh, I've always um, been fascinated by the country. I studied Indian history uh, as a student. I had as my lecturer A.L. Basham. I don't know if any of your listeners uh, know who he is, but he was uh, really the doyen of Indian studies. Uh, in the uh, 60s and 70s, he wrote The Wonder That Was India, uh, mm-hmm. the classic history of, 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 uh, of ancient India that is still in print. Uh, so he was really an inspiration. Um, and I, I guess you know the other. I think the other thing that I always attribute my fascination with India to was uh, I always used to travel with a copy of Murray's Handbook for India. Uh, it was then called India, Ceylon, Burma, and uh, and Pakistan. And uh, this was a handbook that had first come out in the 1850s and had been continuously updated until about the 1960s. And I think I had the last edition, and it was like a gazetteer, uh, and uh, it was also so it, it listed places which you will still not find in Lonely Planet, uh, places of interest in India, which I uh, I I, I um, joyfully, gleefully uh, discovered, um, and I think they probably still remember, you know, little gems of places. It was also a great introduction to the uh, history, architecture, art. Uh, and and uh, society of India as well. So those two things, I think, having Basham as my professor, having this wonderful guidebook, which really got me off the beaten track and really immer- made immersed me in, in Indian uh, culture, uh, were the two things which uh, I owe my continuing interest in. Uh, so that, that that's probably something you won't find on the internet but now you will because i've just told you and it will be uh, there forever inside the space <laughs> well john uh something i was very curious about when i started reading the book and so the book revolves around the jaipur royal family right and it deals with a, a rough period of 100 150 years particularly the previous century and few years of the 18th no the 19th century so what exactly got you fascinated by this particular royal family? Because as everyone knows, India's this microcosm of, you know, almost thousands of royal families with each having their own fascinating mm-hmm. history with their own controversies and the way they go about different things and what they bring to the table in terms of their culture, their history, some of them still surviving in politics till date. Till date. What was so uh, captivating for you about this particular family that got you there? Well, you know, it's, you know, 
as you say, there there were hundreds, or something like 560 uh, princely states at the time of independence. Uh, Jaipur was certainly not uh, one of the. It was it was an important princely state, but it was not up, you know, with the Barodas and the Mysores right. and the Hyderabads and the Kashmir's, you know, in terms of importance. Um, but uh, uh, Jaipur, I, I think it, it's almost uh, uh, synonymous with uh, the idea of princely India because it is. Uh, uh, it sort of ticks all the boxes. For a start, I, I guess it's because it's its proximity to Delhi. Uh, tourists who come to India tend to go to, you know, first timers would go to Delhi, Jaipur, and Agra, um, mm -hmm. and and that I guess is just a, an accident of geography. But um, you know, there, there's obviously a lot more to it than than simply uh, Jaipur as a tourist attraction. I mean, the, the, the royal family of Jaipur is a very interesting one. Um, uh, when, when you go back into the history of, uh, of the Rajputs and the Kachua dynasty particularly, and their, uh, say, relations with uh, the Mughals, with Akbar mm -hmm. in particular, uh, right through to the 19th century, uh, great Maharajas like Ram Singh, Mado Singh, uh, and the imprint that they left, Jai Singh, of course, as well, after whom Jaipur was named. So, so they, they really were quite an extraordinary uh, a dynasty um, that sort of uh, uh, punched beyond its beyond its weight, I guess you could say. Um, but uh, as we approach the, the 20th century, you really start to uh, it, it it really brings into focus uh, the whole story of princely India and just how it, uh, it, you know, modernity, uh, how it responded to the challenges of modernity, how it responded to the challenges of being part of, uh, of, of, of the, um, you know, uh, the British in, in India as well, because yeah. of the relationship between the, the, uh, the rulers and, and, and the British. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and and how they fought against the British in, in some ways, you know, to maintain their independence and how others uh, succumbed to, you know, just accepting the British as, as for what they were. Uh, but then you, you do, of course, the book revolves around uh, Sawai Man Singh and, uh, and his third wife, Gayatri Devi. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're the two principal characters in the book. Mm -hmm. And they were India's uh, first... Uh, uh, you know, they were the equivalent of, uh, you know, JFK and, and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, John and Jackie Kennedy, you know, Prince yeah. Philip and, and, and Elizabeth. I mean, they, they were India's first royal family in many ways because mm -hmm. of the promise they had both in India and overseas. Okay. So that in itself is, is, you know, those things that I've mentioned, plus, you know, it all coalescing together, all coming together in the 20th century around, revolving around these two, you know, quite mm -hmm. extraordinary figures, uh, makes for a fascinating story. I'm 100% agreeing with you on this, like this, uh, and that's something that was, guides me to my next question. So while reading the book, that something extraordinary that you've managed to do, is as you mentioned, the book revolves around Savai Mansingh and Maharani Gayatri Devi. But for me, um, up after the book, they're always going to be Jay and Aisha because that's the narrative form yes. that you've adapted. And that actually brings me to my question to the extent that what was the process of breaking down Savai Mansingh and Gayatri Devi into Jay and Aisha? The question being that taking public yeah. figures and, you know, diving deep into their personal lives. What, how did you go about the process apart from your, the usual publicly available, available sources like their diaries or how were, were there interviews, were there anecdotes that you picked up? How did you go about this? Yeah, look, um, look, uh, so I'm answering Jai. Let's, let's now on refer to him as Jai and to uh, Gayatri Devi's Aisha because uh, I refer to that's how I refer to them in the book. And you know, when you talk to people in Jaipur these days, that's how they refer to those two people as well. Um, Jai, although he died in uh, 1970, quite quite mm -hmm. young, at, at the age of 57, in, uh, while playing polo, um, you, you know, there, there's still many people who who remember him. Uh, mm -hmm. in Jaipur. So I, I met as many of those people as I could. And of course, um, uh, Aisha, who died oh, just over 10 years ago, I think 11 years ago mm -hmm. now, um, you know, she too, uh, I mean, 
there you you know everybody remembers Aisha. Uh, uh, lots of people who are lots of her associates, lots of her friends. Um, I spoke to and, and got a lot of material uh, from them about them. So so in order to deconstruct them from these, uh, you know, the, from their public persona to their you know, to getting into as much as one can into their private lives requires, yeah, um, first and foremost, talking to people who knew them, um, also involves delving into archives, um, reading whatever one can find in, in press reports as well. Um, and, the, and the archives are, are, you know, remarkably rich. I mean, uh, Jai, uh, you know, um, who you know became uh, Maharaja in uh, nineteen in, in the nineteen thirties? Uh, uh, you know there, there's a lot of material. You know for the you know you got around fifteen years of his life was uh, as a ruler was uh, while the British were still in India and his interaction with the British, even him even his uh, you know ad adoption by Madhav Singh, his coming to mm -hmm. to the throne. Uh, the machinations that surrounded that. Uh, there's a lot of background material that you'll find in in, in archives uh, uh, that uh, you know is not publicly known. Um, as far as Aisha is concerned, uh, what one of the uh, revelations in the book is the fact that she had a half sister that she never acknowledged uh, mm -hmm. because her mother um, Indira Devi uh, had a relationship with a, a, a Kashmiri nobleman, uh, sorry, a Hyderabadi nobleman, mm -hmm. uh, Kusru Jung. He later um, uh, uh, went to Kashmir and served under Hari Singh. But uh, uh, you know, and you can only find this out by you know talking to people, or in in in, in this case, by talking to someone you know who was related to, uh, you know, who, who had been married to to. Um, uh, you know that that woman's daughter, uh, you know, and, and and or you know who was the son of uh, Kuswa Jung, you know the person. Mm -hmm. So getting this information from multiple sources. Um, Jai was uh, a notorious philanderer. He had numerous affairs. Um, uh, you know, he loved to travel to England, and uh, Jai and uh, Aisha uh, spent every single Indian summer. Uh, on the continent, except during the war years, and mm -hmm. uh, and and of course, you know, he was a famous polo player as well. I mean, all these different things, you know, wh whether it's his, you know, Jai on the sporting field, Jai, you know, the um, uh, amorous, uh, <laughs> I guess you'd like uh, if you could describe him that way, uh, Indian uh, playboy, uh, Aisha, the the world renowned beauty, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who who. Uh, just dazzled, uh, uh, would dazzle in, in any audience, would stand out from, from the crowd. Uh, you know, all these things, you know, you can really build up a portrait, um, mm -hmm. reading about how other people reacted to them, reading their descriptions of, of, of them in those days, the different stages of their lives. So that's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, you know, the, the Jaipur story is, is, a, is a very tragic one as well, particularly on Aisha's side of the family. Um, mm -hmm. uh, she, of course, was. Um, uh, born in in Kuch Bihar, uh, you know mm. her, her mother Indira Devi had married uh, a man who was third in line to the throne yeah. of Kuch Bihar, but became Maharaja uh, very soon after. Uh, and well, we can talk about all this later. But uh, uh, you know she was very her mother was a very forceful, very interesting character, very liber liberated woman. Woman, and uh, Aisha took after her very strongly. Um, so again, you know, there's all these different. Um, aspects of of their personalities that you you can't just glean from say reading Aisha's uh, memoir for instance it's a very yeah. one sided very sanitized uh, uh, piece of work but once you put it all into context once you once you've um, read descriptions of them as they were in those days once you mm -hmm. um, talk to people who knew them look into archives you get you get a you get a quite a good picture. So, John, I mean, that I get what you mean, right? And the book in itself is, it does make certain assertions, make certain opinions about how things are going about, I mean, but not very clearly or not as overtly as they might be. So what I would actually rather want to get from you is that given the context, your two main characters, Aisha and Jay, right? Like this book actually plays out just like a novel. And that's why I call them characters rather than actual historic personas. 
given the context that they come from, right, their families, the kind of history they evolved into, the turbulent period through which they handed over the entire uh, their princely state to the country, the, their dip in politics, their different natures, their stature in the world around, and in India for that matter. What is your takeaway about their personas to the extent that it's India was going through a very turbulent and in fact, it still is going through a very evo- evolutionary time in the sense that it's moving from a very largely feudal aristocratic society to a more egalitarian society. There's still a lot of issues, but they're not as based on feudalism as they are as they were earlier. Do you think both of them were could have, I don't know, were well adapted to the kind of modernity India took forward because they were morally educated but they also had certain overhangs from their aristocracy which did interfere with how they went mm-hmm. about doing different mm-hmm. things mm-hmm. particularly like Aisha's mm-hmm. experience in Tihar during the emergency where she uh, mm-hmm. she I mean she did enjoy certain benefits which I doubt a lot of other people who were incarcerated during the emergency couldn't so do you think uh, say like 50 years from now when the modern Indian society looks back at them. And I know it's difficult to predict who will, how society would look back at them. But what do you think people's take away from a generic holistic outlook of their life would be? Look, uh, it, it's a really, that's a very uh, broad question. It's quite a difficult question to answer because, you know, in some ways they, they adapted well to the challenges of modernity. In other ways, you know, you can certainly argue that they could have done much more. Uh, I just mentioned the fact that, uh, you know, they spent almost six months of the year, every year um, abroad. Um, and, uh, you know, one, and, and this applies to Jai when he was Maharaja um, uh, and, and in the lead up to independence as well. Uh, and one can argue that, you know, had he stayed uh, in Jaipur and uh, um, taken a more hands-on approach to the administration of the state, uh, you know, things might, you know, Jaipur might have been uh, better managed, uh, you know, you know uh, done well. I mean, it did well, but, you know, you know, you know, the greatness could have been much greater, if you, if you like. Uh, he didn't really play a role in, in politics as, uh, as other, um, other uh, former princes did. Uh, Aisha, of course, did plunge into politics and she was extremely successful. And that, of course, is, if, 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 if that's a measure of, of, of how well um, they could, they have uh, that they adapted to uh, the challenges of modernity, and that's obviously a, a very, you know, she must get top marks for that. Um, but you know, it, it's it's a, you know, it, it's it's a difficult question. I mean, I I, think I do come to the I I, I do um, uh, have have my own opinions about uh, what each could have done uh, better had they. Been more hands-on as uh, as uh, taking their roles um, more seriously, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, I, I think uh, and and again, you know, you, it's it's you know different stages of their lives. They they did take you know Jai was um, uh, quite active in the lead up to you know in, in trying to uh, agitate for the uh, you know stopping the government from uh, abolishing the privy purses, but one can say well that was uh, perhaps a rather selfish thing because uh, you know the privy, privy purses themselves were quite anachronistic. Uh, um, you know he was made Raj Pramukh after independence, and that role was taken away from him. That led to a certain degree of disillusionment on his part. Um, other princes might have, uh, uh, you know, you know, felt that sense of disillusionment, but but uh, uh, done something more directly about it, um, mm-hmm. plunge into politics, or or, or 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 do something more more direct to you know to uh, uh, replace that that role that they uh, that they'd lost. Uh, Jai really didn't. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, it, it, it's it's a it's a it's a you know, it's it's, uh, it's a very broad question, rather difficult one to answer. Uh, you know, without spending uh, quite a bit of time, you know, analysing you know each aspect of of their uh, looking at each of their actions and 
and uh, yeah. and so on. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, a lot. What, what the book I think brings out in terms of Aisha's uh, involvement in politics is that everybody thinks of you know when when they think of her and uh, uh, you know running as a candidate for the Swatantra Party and her landslide victory in her the first time she ran. Um, but uh, there was a lot of uh, unease within the Swatantra Party about her. Right. I mean, not everybody was was enamoured of her, you know. There, there were, right. you know, or, or of Jai uh, as well. So you know, you th there are different sides of the story. There, are, you know, it's not just um, Aisha, you know, the great uh, politician, or Aisha bravely facing the, you know, the the the, the um, terrible ordeal of being uh, thrown into Tihar jail. Uh, mm -hmm. You, know, you you read her memoir. She comes across quite heroic. You you read other accounts of what she was like there. She comes across as being you know rather sad and pathetic. You know, so mm -hmm. it's uh, it's, it's uh, you know it's, yeah, there's there's a lot we could talk about. Okay, so John, let me try putting a different spin to this. Uh, you mentioned that you spoke to a lot of the members of the fam remaining members of the family, and you had an opportunity to interact with a lot of people from Jaipur who remember uh, Jay and Aisha, and a lot of people who can give you accounts about the royal family. So I actually have a two-part question for you. Uh, one is, I must. So as you mentioned, you've been coming to India for almost like four decades now. So and because you've been particularly researching along these lines, do you think, uh, what is the opinion of the common Indian people about the aristocracy or in particular the House of Jaipur? I mean, are they still regarded as, you know, these royal family or royal members who've taken care of the state or, you know, the state people are still obligated to them in terms of gratitude? Or is there this receding idea that, you know, it's an old idea, uh, the idea of royalty is something that has to be relegated back to the dark ages, doesn't belong in modern India. And secondly, uh, based on your interaction with the family, do you think the family members who are somewhat involved in politics and some are in other things, are they still in line with this? Are, are they still, uh, is there some form of disillusionment or uh, disinclination about what the pe public actually views them as and how they actually perceive themselves mm. as? Mm. Uh, interesting question. Look, I, I think, I mean, you know, I haven't, you know, for instance, I, I, I didn't follow Dia Kumari on the hustings uh, when she was running for the BJP. I mean, she won by a landslide uh, mm. in the Loxa elections she got over five lakh uh, a majority of over five lakhs so that says something uh, certainly about her skills as a politician but I think it does say something about the reverence that people do hold uh, mm -hmm. you know the Jaipur royal family in um, she admitted as much when I spoke to her um, but she said it wasn't you know she wasn't you know, obviously she doesn't see herself as as being just another uh, you know privileged royal uh, you know, you know, who's who's using that uh, uh, you know, her, her her family's name or aura to to get uh, you know to, to to garner votes and to get herself into parliament. Um, but I, look, I there's there certainly is that I I imagine uh, it it is more in the rural areas. It's more among an older uh, cross section of voters that the uh, that royalty still has um, uh, you know, this aura, but then again, witness the you know enormous outpouring uh, of, of grief uh, when uh, Aisha died just uh, uh, 10, 11 years ago. I mean, you know, I think yeah. lakhs and lakhs of people um, uh, line the streets of the old city of Jaipur um, and and the route to the um, uh, cremation ground. Uh, when she died, and, and that certainly uh, says something about uh, uh, you know the respect people held her in. She, you know, she, you know, her her, her lasting legacy uh, was not uh, uh, just uh, you know these these you know gilded palaces and pavilions and so on. It was the work she did in the sphere of education, the charity work, uh, you know, her support of uh, arts and crafts uh and, and you know and, and even you know she was still um 
you know, rallying for the rights of slum dwellers <laughs> in, in Jaipur up and, you know, up until just a couple of years before her death. And I think all these things, you know, mean something to people and they can see that she was, uh, you know, she wasn't afraid to get her sari smudged <laughs> uh, with dust. Um, in terms of the second part of your question and how um, they see their themselves and their role, look, uh, you know, they, they, you know, clearly, I mean, if you look at uh, Padma Nab, uh, you know, the current Maharaja, uh, and I say that in quotation marks because he doesn't, he's, it's only, it's, it's, he has no role as such. It's, 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 a, it's a title without really any meaning. But, you know, he's also taking his, you know, his role uh, seriously. He realizes, uh, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the importance of maintaining the family's legacy. Uh, you know, the, 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 the fact is that, um, uh, you know, it's not just the, the, the members of the family that, that constitute what is royalty in Jaipur. It's, it's the, uh, it's the marble and the mortar, it's the bricks, it's the palaces, it's the forts, it's yeah. the yeah. city museum with its incredible um, yeah. collections of, of, of art, uh, all these things which attracts, you know, hundreds of uh, thousands of tourists, uh, Indian and foreign, uh, all the time. And, you know, they marvel at, at the, you know, at the artistic skill that uh, went into building these palaces at the the the, the, the Fine art uh, that that's stored in there, all these sorts of things you know, combined, and and I think that the family now uh, you know understands and has for a very long time the importance of all of this and and of uh, uh, maintaining it and making it accessible and, uh, yeah. and, and and so on. So I think you know they 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 I don't think that they see themselves as being irrelevant in any way. I think they see a, a continuing relevance for themselves. I mean, uh, Padmanab, when I spoke to him, he, he, you know, he wants to do as much as he can to, to uh, promote and preserve Jaipur's cultural heritage. And I think that's a really good thing. Yeah. No, so uh, I'll tell you the real reason why I asked you this question, John, because uh, something mm. that you, for Jay and Aisha, to have carried forward a legacy into modern India was slightly easier, given that they came from roles which actually enjoyed meanings, right? Before the independence, they were actually rulers. And however subservient their relationship with the British was, they did enjoy certain powers and hold and grasp over the administration. And although it was on a, and it's been on a continuous decline ever since independence due to the new constitutional structure in India. But what, this dictomy of how Something that you mentioned about uh, the outpouring of grief when on Aisha's death. I come from a North Indian family. My family hails from Uttar Pradesh and we live in Mumbai. But uh, I remember 11 years ago when I was a child and when we heard about uh, Maharani Gayatri Devi's death, there was actual grief in my family as well, even though we had absolutely no impact from either her, uh, let's say, social work in terms of education or craft or anything else. Or for the mat for that matter, from the Jaipur royal family, we were never subjects in that sense, or like for anyone from my family. Yet there is this reverence that revolves around ancient or older royal families in India. But what I sense today, as like a twenty-five-year-old man in India, is that people who were not there to witness this previous generation are kind of losing this reverence or this idea of glamour around them for them and there are it may or may not be questionable but there is a definite downtrend in this perspective and that's why i wanted to ask you this about how the family views itself because as you mentioned uh, the current maharaj is a titular maharaj in terms of his ability mm -hmm. to do things as as willing as he he may be is very limited so it's just an interesting way of so as you mentioned, like the forts and books like yours are the ones which actually will sustain the legacy of the family much more than what maybe the Maharaja of yeah. Jaipur can right now do. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just my two cents on the <laughs> entire thing. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Yeah. but if I can pivot slightly back to uh, you as a person, and I just wanted to come back to, um, you do mentioned like your fascination with history and 
you know with indian history in particular and how attached you are to the country uh was there something that sparked this interest in the first place i mean as a child, was there maybe you visited india as a child and got saw something or i don't know what 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 was so special about the subcontinent <laughs> that got you interested in it mm. oh look I, i i when i finished school and uh, as was a, a bit of a tradition in in those days uh uh very few of us went straight to university it was a, a rite of passage was to travel and, and i traveled uh, all through asia um, on a shoestring pretty much uh, uh staying in salvation army guest houses in calcutta and mumbai and places like that um but it's also one of the best ways of seeing the country too uh exactly you know, staying in uh, railway uh, retire retiring rooms and dak bungalows and and things like that um uh, but look uh, of all the co- i wasn't really sure what i wanted to do of all the countries that i visited on that trip and you know i started in indonesia and ended up in europe and traveled through afghanistan and burma and iran and all these places sri lanka and so on india was a country that was most fascinating for me um and, and but, but i also had a real sense then and this is really 40 years ago that uh india was go you know was uh, this sleeping giant it was uh, going to play it was important you know for, I, i felt that i wanted to invest in uh learning as much as i could about this country uh mm-hmm. studying it i even studied hindi uh university and uh tried to sort of pivot my you know career uh in, in, in as much as possible towards india and i've worked in india as a diplomat and foreign correspondent and of course now um you know kept coming back as a writer and researcher for well over a decade uh or probably a decade and a half um you know but i i felt that you know especially as an australian because we are this little funny we are this big island but you know at you know surrounded by the pacific and indian oceans and then you've got you know southeast asia and 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 the asian landmass to our north and uh, you know with a sort of strange anglo saxon outpost uh, unfortunately <laughs> now it's become very much more multicultural and you know, i think indians are the largest migrant group uh, one of the largest uh, migrant groups uh, in the country which is a great thing but i i felt that i really that we really you know we need to take our asian neighbors seriously and um of those neighbors india is the country that we really need to watch sure everybody's talking about china and you know there's it's causing great uh, havoc around the world <laughs> um um you know the relationship between china and America and China and Australia that it's all very fraught but uh uh but India is is you know it's not the ec- economic giant that China is but it's a you know it, you know it's a country that really we have to um take notice of and uh 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 and and try and understand because it's going to play an extremely important role not just in asian affairs but world affairs and uh you know we we both countries that uh, share the same uh you know indian ocean <laughs> rim um and uh you know that's important as well it's it's unfortunate that most of the population of australia is on the eastern seaboard so we tend to look towards america <laughs> uh but uh, if say the capital of australia was perth then uh, you know india would play a much more prominent role but for me right from that very early times i really felt that uh, uh i i thought that you know that investing um as much time uh as i could studying working you know just immersing myself in india would would be uh, important uh, and 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 i feel like it has paid off because i've uh, now written four books on india i've got more in the pipeline i i still love going there i've got many friends and contacts it's a very exciting place i'm hoping to do a lot more uh work there you know, once things settle down and reopen and so on yeah. yeah so john tell us about this next book that you have in the pipeline and before anything else i must really congratulate you your investment has paid <laughs> rich dividends india you <laughs> quite correctly predicted uh i guess this century did india did pick up a major role in world affairs and particularly from towards the end of the previous century so well, good stuff mm. there 
Yeah. Well, at the moment, I'm working on a short history of India for a Melbourne publisher. Oh, okay. Uh, so it's a 50,000 word history of India, which is a real challenge to write, because as you can imagine, it's yep. a lot of history to cram into that short space. Yes. Um, I've got another book, which is going to be uh, uh, the biography of a, a very famous Indian magician, Gogia Pasha, who oh. was uh, PC Sorkar's chief rival. And that's um, bouncing off my um, previous book, which was on the uh, history of Indian magic. Uh, and then Juggernaut wants me to write a book on the role of uh, the princely states in the lead up to independence. So, uh, as, as, as you know, uh, um, getting the uh, princely states uh, uh, on board um, was, uh, you know, crucial uh, when it came to, you know, in the lead up to independence, I mean, there were some states which uh, didn't play ball, like Hyderabad and uh, um, and Kashmir, of course, was uh, another one. But there was there were other. Uh, so it's it's that you know that that lead up uh, to independence and the role of the princely states uh, in that is is what I'll be uh, looking at next. But that's uh, still a long way off. I haven't even dip my toes into that <laughs> yes but i'm looking forward to writing it well john you sound like you have your hands full with all these books and to be very honest i am i this was your first book by you that i've read and i honestly can't wait to read more of your work especially the fifty thousand word uh, history of india because so <laughs> as, as as someone who's born brought up in india who's actually gone through who's had history for literally every year of school I still can't say that I've studied the entire history of India. So it'll be a very fascinating take to see how uh, the history of our entire nation is you know, compressed into 50,000 mm. words. <laughs> but I trust you'll do a great job at it. Like look, looking at the book I've read now, that's I definitely trust you with it. And I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, well, thank you for joining us on the Kitabi Karwan podcast, John. This was a pleasure hearing from you. Siddharth, it was a pleasure talking to you. I hope we can do this again next book. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> when it comes around. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Okay. Thank you for tuning in to the Kitabi Karwan podcast. Do check out the rest of our work and our interviews with authors who you love and some tips about reading. And stay tuned and check out our channel for really interesting content, discussions, live interviews, and well, just words and opinions and everything about books. Thank you. Thank you.